Hi, um, welcome you guys to another little live thing. My dog has just walked in the room. Um, this is a little live stream on a essay plan that I made. And it is about how far the Aeneid is just Augustan propaganda. So, sorry, my dog is currently stood behind me. We're just going to ignore her. So, I'm going to read through it. I'm going to explain it to you. I've done some highlighting. And then that's all I'm going to do for today. Um, okay. So, as always, I'm just going to clarify. This is written for the A-level spec from OCR for their module, World of the Hero, for the Aeneid. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on books three or five because they're not there. Okay? Right. So the question that I set myself was how far is the Aeneid just Augustan propaganda? So here's my introduction. I don't know whether it's very good, but here we go. Augustus, the first emperor, though not in name of Rome, commissioned Virgil through his version of an arts and culture minister, Mycenas, to write something about him, something that would glorify Rome and become a national epic, much like Homer's had been in Greece. When we take into account the circumstances of its creation, the Aeneid from its very commencement seems to most obviously be Augustan propaganda, because it was written for Augustus and commissioned by that very same man. However, while this is the most obvious reading and obviously holds at least some merit, the act of pinning the entire epic down to that one purpose is horrifyingly reductive, and there are so many more aspects to this poem that come into mind. Through this, I would not suggest that the poem is not Augustan propaganda in any shape or form, because there are certainly some aspects of it that are. But I take issue with the adjective just, because it is quite simply so reductive for such a multifac multifaceted piece of literature. So what I'm trying to get to, uh, get at in this introduction is the fact that, yes, it is partly Augustan propaganda. We can't ignore that. It was commissioned by Augustus himself. And Virgil couldn't really go against Augustus because, you know, Augustus would just get rid of him, as he did to many other people, such as Ovid, uh, exiled because he annoyed him. He exiled his own granddaughter and his own daughter. Um, this guy is not a guy that you want to mess around. But while obviously it is partly Augustine propaganda, we can't ignore other purposes of the text. And we also can't ignore that parts of it could be seen to be anti-Augustine. Of course, very subtly, because if Augustus finds out or if Mycenas finds out, you're in trouble. But um, they're still there and you can't ignore those. It's a very reductive idea to just go straight down the line of this is Augustan propaganda. Um, and it's the same with everything. You can't give something one purpose because things never have just one purpose. <laughs> this is just a lesson for life. Nothing ever only has one purpose. OK. Okay, so firstly, I'm going to talk about how it is Augustan propaganda. So there are certainly some aspects that are Augustan propaganda, and we can't doubt that. Um, and as R.D. Williams says, the major intention of Virgil's poem was to glorify his own country. That cannot be ignored. Augustus is both directly and indirectly glorified throughout the poem in various situations through the character of Aeneas, uh, if we take Aeneas to be a kind of Augustus, and through appearances of his own. So, I'm just going to go through it chronologically on the bits that I think glorify Augustus and could be considered Augustan propaganda. So, book one, Jupiter says, quite obviously, to them I give empire without end. That's pretty glorifying, especially in the sense of Augustus, because he is the one who started the empire. Um, book two, Aeneas carries his father on his shoulders and leads his son out of Troy, with his father carrying the Penates, the household gods of Troy. That shows piety. Piety was a very important thing with uh, the Romans, and especially with Augustus himself. He was known for his piety, just as, uh, just as Aeneas is. Augustus was religious. He was the religious guy. He restored 82 temples during his whole principate. He built countless more. He he um, created the Ludi Seculare. He was the br bringer of a new golden age. All of that. That I will go over in a, another live stream, possibly about um, Imperial Image. But yeah, I know a kind of dumb amount about the background because I did Imperial Image. So, um, okay. Book 
I almost said four. Book six. Sorry, I've got it in Roman numerals. Uh, book six. Augustus is directly mentioned in the pageant of heroes um, with Anchises, where he is placed right next to Romulus, thus equating him with the originary founder of Rome, the man who gave his name to this great city. That's pretty good propaganda. But I would suggest um, there's one important thing that he does miss out about Romulus, and I'm sure you can guess it if you know the myth for outside he does not mention that he murdered his brother um and i was thinking over this and i thought maybe that's a comment on how augustus sort of swept all of the bad things he did um under the rug with his new name so when he was octavian he was known for being uh brutal merciless violent and now the moment that he gets um a new name all of that's gone. He's a completely new person. He's peaceful. He doesn't like war, um, which I would agree that he did. And I would agree that part of the Onion's purpose is dramatising this split between Octavian and Augustus. At the beginning, um, Aeneas is like Augustus. He's peaceful. He doesn't want war. But at the second half, he's violent. Um, he isn't merciful. And I think that's him more as Octavian, and Octavian does break out a lot. So, um, but anyway, we're not there yet. We're still talking about propaganda. Um, so the ancient critic Servius would suggest that Virgil's intention was undoubtedly to praise Augustus by the means of his ancestors. So by bringing all of these ancestors in, so um, obviously you've got Dardanus, Romulus, all of those guys, Julius Caesar, bringing them in, he's praising Augustus through them, which is, it's a reasonable reading. And it's obviously the uh, contemporary reading because of Servius. Um, but I think we must understand that there were limitations to these contemporary readings because what else can they do? Um, if they believe that anything is anti-Augustan or anti-imperial, um, then they'll be in trouble and the author will be in trouble. So they can't write it down. They can think it, but they can't really write it down. And uh, obviously because the general thought at the time was, oh, how amazing is Augustus? Um, they're not really going to go against that. They don't tend to go against the grain like we would nowadays. Okay, so book seven, we have the closing of the gates of Janus. This symbolizes peace. Augustus did this three times during his reign and it had only been done twice before. So that would sort of um, bring up Augustan Pax, um, Augustan peace, how amazing is Augustus, he brings peace to Rome. Book eight, we have the glorification of Rome on the shield with Augustus in the centre. This equates him with great mythological and historical heroes, such as Manlius, who prevented the invasion of the Gauls. Uh, this is my favourite story. Um, he was asleep, the Gauls were about to invade, and his geese started to honk because they saw these people climbing over the walls, and then they prevented the invasion of the Gauls. Uh, and even Cloelia, who escaped from the Gauls and was brought back by the Romans because that's sort of their thing. It's a bit weird. If, the, if a captive escapes, they take it back to the person. Not normal. And they were so impressed that they let her let go of whoever she wanted. And instead of choosing herself and her friends, she chose uh, the best Roman warriors. So she was very impressive. Um, so this indirect and indirect glorification, indirect and indirect, direct and indirect, Glorification of Augustus sets the tone for the poem, and through this, I think we could perhaps suggest that Augustan propaganda is an important element of the epic, but it is certainly not the defining feature of the Aeneid. And now we're going to go into the other purposes, which I find much more convincing. Okay, so anti Augustan. Uh, as explored before, Aeneas can be interpreted to be a kind of figure for Augustus. They seem to have two particular qualities that tie them together those being piety and a seeming lack of desire for power. And T.R. Glover would suggest that the emperor was a sort of painter's model for Aeneas. Now, that's fine. I mean, he's a hero. That, that's, that could be seen as propaganda. But this becomes problematic when we consider the problematic things that Aeneas does throughout the epic. So book four, he abandons Dido. Um, obviously, we could take this as propaganda because he's doing this for his fate. He's doing it for duty. He's doing it for Rome. He's being pious towards Rome. Uh, and he's leaving an Eastern woman. I mean, this is completely different to Mark Antony, who stayed with Cleopatra, married her, had kids with her, gave Roman territory to his kids in the donations of Alexandria in 34 BC. I mean, 
perhaps that's drawing a distinction between him. Perhaps that's linking him to Julius Caesar, who was with Cleopatra and left, maybe. Um, book six, The Golden Bow. Now, this is a very interesting one, and it was alerted to me by my teacher. So thank you, Miss Bradley. But um, The Golden Bow, The Golden Bow, must come off willingly. OK, that's a big point. The Sybil it makes it very clear that you can only go into the underworld if the golden bow comes to you and you it lets you take it willingly. Aeneas has to pull it off. Perhaps this is against fate, OK? And the same thing happens with Lavinia. Lavinia is meant to marry a foreign man, but Aeneas is technically descended from Dardanus, who came from Latium, where she comes from. So technically, he's not foreign. Whereas Turnus is descended from foreign people. So technically he's the foreign one. So perhaps Virgil is suggesting that Aeneas' founding of Rome may have been fated, but the other stuff that he does throughout isn't fated. Or perhaps he's suggesting that Augustus' claims that he was fated to rule over Rome are false. Um, maybe he's forced fate. Maybe fate doesn't exist and he's just forced it. Who knows? Um and this could obviously link to what Jasper Griffin suggests. Um, he suggests that Augustus's uh, campaign and ruling were seen as the uncrolled, uncrolled, uncontrolled. Sorry, my voice is terrible today. The uncontrolled domination of a man whose whole career was illegal. Okay, pretty important. Book ten: He commits a human sacrifice, kills a priest, even though he begs for his life to be slain saved and then kills Lausus and Mesentius. Now Mesentius was a horrible guy so we're just going to brush that under the rug. I know it's bad but he was a horrible man so we're just, just ignoring that. Uh, man, uh, Manlius, no, wrong person. Lausus was a young man. He was Mesentius's son but he was a young man and he was a good man and Aeneas regrets killing him. So um, Pat I was about to say palace, he does not feel palace. Uh, Magus, the priest that he killed, begs for his mercy by um, by his own sons. And Aeneas kills him anyway. It's a bit dodgy. Um, and also, it's just he does some really bad stuff, okay? He does bad stuff. Human sacrifice is never good, okay? <laughs> life lessons um <laughs> okay so book 12 um he commits a brutal murder of turnus after he sees palace's belt and i mean we have to have the question of is this justified um partially yes because turnus has broken sort of the moral code by taking armor that from someone who's died and not dedicating it to a god he's broken the code uh but I don't really think it is because it could link him to Achilles who completely lacked restraint um, and who would have been criticised by the Romans for his uncontrollable furor after his boyfriend Patroclus died. Um, but I would suggest, as I, as I said before, that this sudden reversion to violence dramatises the split of personalities between Octavian and Augustus. Before his name change, Augustus was violent and merciless and that all changed very quickly. So... In my mind, maybe Virgil is saying that this could happen just as quickly as again. Augustus could revert to violence just as quickly again. Like it could happen, and we can't be unaware of this. So, next purpose would be Roman Homer. Uh, putting aside Augustus entirely, there are certainly other aspects of the Aeneid that can come about as its purpose, and that would prove that it cannot simply be reduced to a case of it being propaganda, propaganda, propaganda for the emperor. Virgil was mimicking the great epic poet from Greece, Homer, and in his own way was making himself into the Roman Homer. And we can see this through various plot devices and literary techniques that we see him use. So the first one would be, he directly takes a minor character from the Iliad and makes him his protagonist. Uh, Aeneas, as I said in my um, summary yesterday, he was a completely unimportant bit character from the Iliad and Virgil takes him and develops him into the ancestor of Rome. Of course, that had already been done, but it's just a bit, you know. Uh, the first half of the epic can be said to mirror the Odyssey while the second half mirrors the Iliad. So, uh, as I said yesterday, I believe, the first half is a bit like a mini Odyssey. It's a bit of a rip-off. Second half, war, Iliad. 
there are similar plot points. The wars fought over a woman. Helen and Lavinia are quite similar. They're both quite silent. Um, Aeneas goes on in the same journey that Odysseus goes on in books 9 to 12 in book 3. I know I said I wasn't going to mention book three, but that was too much of a good point to ignore. Uh, Homeric similes and epithets are used. For example, loyal Achates, pious Aeneas, and there's a simile in book one that compares the soothing of the winds by Neptune to the calming of a riot by Roman statesmen. That could be propaganda. You could say that Augustus calmed um, the chaos in Rome but it's pretty Homeric, so we're just going to go with Homeric. Uh, in the words of the critic Gransden, the whole of the Aeneid might be called Odyssean in that it reflects both the theme and structure, structure of the Odyssey. And through this, there is certainly a sense that Virgil wanted to show off his learning and make himself out to be as brilliant as Homer, sort of a new Homer, if you will. And I mean, I think he was rather successful. I mean, his epic is one of the one of the three biggest epics in the world. It was saved. I mean, so much stuff was burnt in the fire at Alexandria, and we kept we kept the Aeneid. I would have preferred if we'd kept the uh, Titanomachy, but you know, if we've got the Aeneid, that's good enough. Titanomachy would have been fun. If you don't know what the Titanomachy is, it would have been the most amazing epic ever. But someone burned it. I don't know who it was, but I absolutely hate them. I know they're historic, but I hate them. <laughs> so, etiology. The Aeneid also has an etiological purpose, which can be seen through various references throughout to Roman places and customs. So, from that sentence, you probably figured it out, but I'm just going to tell you. Etiology is the um, explanation of where place names and people and customs come from. Okay, so in the words of Williams, the word that the world that Virgil describes would be recognisable to his audience, an ancient echo from a heroic past. Most of these etiological echoes come from Book 8, as seen here. There's a mention of the River Tiber, the very famous river of Rome, and the people would know they were coming to the future sites of Rome. Evander describes the origin of the Aura Maxima and the festival to Hercules. Augustus associated himself with Hercules, so perhaps this could link to his propaganda, but in the sense that he fought against barbarity, like Her Hercules fought against Cacus, but, you know, again, not entirely convinced. Um, the various mentions on the shields of mythology and history, for example, Manus and the Geese, as I've already mentioned, or even the Battle of Actium, that could have a propagandic element. But um, I think the important thing about the mention of the Battle of Actium is the fact that Augustus is with Agrippa. He's not fighting them alone. He's got Agrippa with him. And that sort of makes me think maybe he's saying that Augustus couldn't have done it without, without Agrippa. But uh, through this, there is certainly a sense that Virgil also sets out to explain to his Roman audience where their customs, festivals and the places that they worship in and people they believe in come from. Roman values next. Uh, Virgil also wants to get across his idea of Roman values and morals that should be propagated throughout Roman society, giving the epic a kind of didactic purpose, that's a teaching purpose. Just as the Odyssey had the morals of Xenia and loyalty, while the Iliad gave ideas of moderation and proper conduct in war. When Virgil wrote his epic, as T.S. Patty says, his hero had to be an ideal Roman hero with qualities of leadership, a sort of model for Augustus and his successors. Through his Roman hero, he promotes equalities such as the following. Father-son relationships with Aeneas and Anchises, Aeneas and Scanius, Evander and Pallas. Pietas towards the state with his loyalty to the founding of Rome after the underworld. Uh, to this family with his assistance in taking his father out of Troy. To religion with his epithet of pious and he's taking the Panates out of Troy. Uh, peace, he doesn't want war, obviously. Um history, the etiological mentions, um, loyalty, you've got Achates, Aeneas' companion, is described with the epithet loyal Achates. Um, Gravitas, Aeneas takes his mission very seriously. Dignitas, same reason, Clementia. Um, now this is an interesting one, because Aeneas doesn't really show any Clementia at all in any meaningful way. He kills a priest when he's begging for his life, Magus in Book 10. He commits a human sacrifice, and he abandons his Clementia when he sees Pallas's belt on Turnus. Could this be a suggestion that mercy cannot exist um, with hatred in a war environment? Or is it a comment on the fact that Augustus could very quickly and easily go back to as he was before when known as Octavian? up to you you know how i feel 
Um, Virtus Aeneas shows immense courage through continuing on his quest and fighting to save Troy. I mean, that would be pretty scary. Um, and Eustitia, this is also interesting because there isn't much justice. Aeneas is more unjust than any other character in the play because of the numerous questionable things that he does, such as abandoning Dido, killing Turnus, human sacrifice. Um, again, same reasons as Clementia. You decide, you know what I think. These in turn make him the perfect Roman hero. And while they push along the Augustan ideas to some extent, I don't believe that they can be called propaganda because Augustus played off tradition. I think that Aeneas is more of the perfect Roman hero, in the words of Sally Knights, than the perfect Augustan mouthpiece. Now, that's a clear distinction that you need to make. Um, is he an Augustan hero or a Roman hero? Because they're quite different things. I mean, they're quite similar but they're different at the same time. And you also got to take into account that Augustus played off of tradition and Roman morals. So maybe they intertwine and therefore maybe we can't say it's Augustan propaganda, but more Roman propaganda. Finally, the final purpose I could think of, you can probably think of more, is um, anti-war. Um, so Virgil does not like war. Uh, he'd lived through the effects of it. He was subject to the stripping of farmland from rural natives in Italy by Augustus himself. So why would he write propaganda about him um, in order to make room for his veterans? And he lived to witness the civil wars. As well as this, there was a lot of general movement against war by the public. They had to witness two brutal civil wars and not long before them, the Punic Wars, with a lot of bloodshed and death. Um, so this is presented a lot in the Aeneid, uh, both with war shown negatively and some anti-war sentiment from the characters within the play. Within the play, Sorry, I've been doing too much drama uh, um, within the epic. So, book seven, Latinus refuses to take part in the war. Book eight, it is hinted that Pallas will die as Evander collapses. Book ten, he calls war the plague of war. Aeneas commits the murder of the priest and human sacrifice in the same book. We have the deaths of Pallas, Lausus, Lorides, Simba, Alcanor and his brothers, lots of young men. Um, book 12, he has Aeneas commit the atrocious act of killing Turnus violently, uh, leaving a dark tone hanging over the end of the poem. As Jasper Griffin says, the effect, haunting, complex and in harmony with the rest of the poem is deliberate. Uh, he hangs a martyr, uh, death of countless Trojans and Latins, and the suggestion that war is inevitable because Juturna incites the Romans to begin it again, and not even Aeneas can stop it because he's wounded. Through this, we can certainly see that an anti-war message is put through. In the words of T.S. Patty, Virgil's whole nature is on the side of peace. And this would certainly make me suggest that the purpose of the Aeneid is not simply Augustan propaganda. Of course, part of Augustus' propaganda was, was peace, but it was peace through war. And through the clear abhorrence for war in general that Virgil shows throughout, I think we can thoroughly rule this reading out. So... I'm just going to tell you my opinion now. The idea is not just Augustan propaganda. It makes me very angry to think that people think that. It, of course, it is partially, partially that, but you cannot reduce something so multi-layered and so multifaceted into such a singular purpose that doesn't make any sense at all, <laughs> okay? Um, so yeah, that's the end of my live stream today. I might do another one or something else. I don't know. I still got revision to do. But um, I hope you enjoyed it. I just thought I would go through this to help myself remember it and to help other people because, you know, Augustine propaganda could come up. A question like this could come up in the actual A-level exam. So, and also it's just a really interesting thing to discuss. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you don't mind my room being too messy. Again, I've got all my books on my bed. Um, um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you've got any questions, please let me know. If you've got anything that you want me to cover, please let me know. Um, look down in the description for what I study and what I can help you with. And I will see you soon.